Welcome to a perspective roundtable from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Atul Gawande, a staff surgeon at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and an associate professor at the Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health. In the August 14th issue of the journal, Busick and colleagues report on the three pediatric heart transplantations they did using hearts donated following the declaration of death of three infants in Colorado. These were dying infants who had severe neurological injuries but who did not meet the criteria for brain death. The parents in each case had requested withdrawal of life support and also given written informed consent for donation after the cardiac death of their child. So three minutes after cardiac activity ceased in the first child and only 75 seconds after it ceased in the second two children, the doctors declared death and removed the hearts for transplantation. These cases then raise some fundamental ethical questions, and with me here to discuss these issues are Dr. Robert Trug, Professor of Medical Ethics, Anesthesiology, and Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and the co-author of a current perspective article on the dead donor rule. Arthur Kaplan, a professor of bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania, and George Annis, a professor in the Department of Health, Law, Bioethics, and Human Rights at Boston University School of Public Health. Professor Kaplan, what is the dead donor rule? The dead donor rule says we take organs, vital organs, only from those who've been clearly, unequivocally pronounced dead. So nothing will happen in terms of procurement, requests, anything, until you've got a team that establishes death. Dr. Trug, how in your own hospital and the way you've seen it done in other children's hospital do we know if a child is actually dead and uh, eligible for transplant? Uh, the, the ways that um, children die where they can be organ donors traditionally has been through the brain death pathway, where in children with devastating neurological injury, we examine them to make sure that there's nothing that's potentially reversible, to make sure that they're comatose, that they're apneic, they have no brainstem reflexes, and then we declare them dead while they are on the ventilator and the organs are still being perfused by blood from the heart. Now donation after cardiac death is relatively new in pediatrics, but this is where you wait until the heart has stopped for a certain period of time. There's been a, a lot of discussion about how long one has to wait after the heart stops before we say it is irreversible. And there has been a general consensus with very little data that that needs to be somewhere between two and five minutes. Uh, the rationale for that's a little murky, frankly. Um, the uh, thing that people often cite is that we don't know of any hearts that have ever started on their own again after having stopped for 65 to 75 seconds. But that's not to say that if you tried to restart the heart, after two minutes, three minutes, even five minutes, that it couldn't be successful. And so it calls into question what we mean by the word irreversible. Since the declaration of death requires the irreversible cessation of cardiac function, by irreversible do we mean that the heart could not be started again, in which case five minutes may not be long enough, or by irreversible do we mean it's enough that we've simply chosen not to try to start the heart again and that's the ethically relevant uh, way of thinking about it. Well, so this is where it, it cuts to the chase. Did these cases abide by the dead donor rule? Well, I think they did not. I think they're trying to change the dead donor rule uh, by saying that, you know, historically irreversible cessation of uh, cardiac and respiratory function meant it's irreversible, that you can't reverse it, you can't try. So the argument is, well, if we're not gonna do it, if the parents said don't reverse it, uh, then it's irreversible. Well, of course it's not. I mean, that's a play on words. The fact that you could bring the heart back here in your mind, just because you could transplant it in another child successfully, meant that they were not dead in your mind. It's not just in my mind. It's yeah. I think it's the law. And uh, also, the, I think it's the most critical thing, and uh, Arthur has pointed that out, is to distinguish dying people from dead people. We want to take care of dying people. Dying people have are persons with constitutional rights. Uh, doctors have an obligation uh, to take good care of them so they don't suffer at least. And 
and not to kill them. And dead people, who are not pe persons anymore, have no constitutional rights, no rights at all, who can reasonably, with the, their own assent uh, or with the assent of their parents, be used as organ donors. And that's, that's always been the rule. Uh, the, our question and the question that the Denver group raises is, should we change the rules? I think, in my view, the whole discussion about whether they're dead or not is really to miss the point. And I think that these cases from Denver uh, are very illustrative of the issue because, you know, here you have three babies who are certainly going to die. You have their parents who are apparently highly motivated to donate their organs. You have three other babies whose only chance of survival is to be able to receive this gift. Um, it, it's a situation where, you know, all of the ethical vectors are kind of lined up in the right direction. I mean, I, I think that for many people looking at that, they'd say, it seems unethical not to allow this to happen. There's only good things that can come out of this. And yet, we have the dead donor rule, which says that we can't remove these organs unless these babies are declared dead. And yet the problem is, is that the babies don't look very dead. In fact, everyone here is saying they're not dead. Um, and so I think that the solution to that has been exactly the wrong way to go. The solution that medicine and society have taken is to continue to tweak and manipulate the definition of death so that we can progressively include different kinds of patients under that umbrella. Uh, and, you know, to me, it seems that that's the problem and that what we really ought to be going back to is what are, what, what's the patient's prognosis, what's the neurological condition, what are the preferences of the, of the patient and the family, and we should respect those. And the dead donor rule, for all of its historical significance, really misses the point. What you would suggest substituting is a mix of um, consent from a surrogate most of the time uh, for you to have your organs donated when you've had loss of nearly all of the higher functions, loss of major ability to provide consciousness in the brain. But wouldn't um, that just be death by organ removal? Uh, yes, it would be. Um, but I think that there's, there's two caveats that would be very important safeguards there. The first is uh, a strong emphasis upon informed consent and making sure that you have the permission of the patient, if possible, before their injury or the appropriate surrogate, if not. And then, you know, you don't want people committing suicide to donate their organs if they're otherwise healthy. So you need to have safeguards to make sure that this person has, for example, such devastating neurological injury that the loss of their vital organs is really no longer a harm to them. Um, and under those circumstances, I think actually it's a much cleaner way to go and avoids all of the, the, the crazy stuff that we're talking about here in terms of how do we diagnose death.